Good morning. Let's turn to Mark chapter 9, 30 through 32. We'll begin with. And they departed from where, from there and passed through Galilee. And he would not that any man should know it, for he taught his disciples and said unto them, The Son of Man is delivered into the hands of men, and they shall kill him, and after he's killed he shall rise the third day. But they understood not that saying, and they were afraid to ask him. Lord God, we come to you right now. We ask that you come down in a powerful way, that you anoint these words, that you anoint your vessel, that you be lifted up, glorified, that you uh, sharpen your word, that it impacts us for the purpose of changing us and lining us up to what we need to understand about you. Lord, we need to have a life that is active and real and acceptable and pleasing to you. And we just thank you for who you are. We praise you. And we ask, Lord, that you come down in a powerful way, meet with us, talk to us, minister to us, and challenge us, Lord, to become the people you've called us to become. We just thank you and praise you, and we say this in your name. Amen. You know, Mark is about the gospel of Jesus Christ, and the power of the gospel is really the light of the gospel, which is who Jesus is and what he did for us. But the real challenge for us as Christians is how do we tap in or how do we get a hold of the power of the gospel? And how we get a hold of the power of the gospel is only one way, and that's through faith, genuine faith. And the problem is there's so many counterfeit faiths out there being presented. And these counterfeit faiths are not towards God, uh, basically, they're towards man getting his way with God. They're towards man getting what he desires. Uh, it, it's, it's, it's about man's selfish ways being, uh, you know, catered to by the so-called faith. And the problem is that so much of these counterfeit faiths are coming through Christian TV and Christian radio from these heretics. And, and the more you listen to these heretics talk about their formula of faith and how you can get God to bow down to all the desires and fleshly whims you have so that you can get your mansions and your cars and all this, is that what you understand is these people are totally ignorant towards the holy God of heaven. They don't know God. They're operating out of their own mode in order to oftentimes to get people to support them in their heretic heretical reality so they can have mansions and go around and say, this is how I got it. You know, I control God. I got God to do it my way. And so I'm going to teach you how to do it. And all the time, what they don't realize, these people are being seduced into this false reality. And this false faith is nothing is going to create nothing but ignorance towards God and cause people to walk in unbelief towards him. And you need to really understand that. Faith is towards God, not towards selfish men to get his way with God. It is not about uh, us getting God to do what we want. It's about us coming to terms with, with what God wants to do. And in order for God to have his way, we have to put our faith in his character, in his person, in who he is. That's what faith is all about. Faith is directed towards God, not directed towards my whims and my selfishness as a means to figure out how God, get, to get God to do it my way. And this is the reality of most counterfeit faiths that you hear about. It's all about me, myself, and I, and God doing, dancing to my tune because I have the right formula to get him to dance to my tune so that I can have this unrealistic reality and, and mark it down, this is Christianity. And people, it's a lie from the pit of hell. It's destroying people's lives. It's destroying what true faith they have. It's undermining it, which is a real battle today. We're contending for the faith that was first delivered to the saints. And it's so hard to find because people don't understand what it's about. And so when you study the Gospel of Mark, the issue of faith is there all the time. It's there. Because faith is what allows the power of the Gospel to have its way in your life. 
the power of the gospel, salvation, not being rich and not having a fake reality where everything is positive and nothing bad is going on. That's a bunch of baloney. That's not realistic. It's not life. And people, we need to connect to what is life so we can have truth, so we can put our faith towards God in whatever is challenging us. But it's faith towards God. Faith is based on his character, not on what he's doing. And that's what you have to understand. And what, I, what my faith is based on is that God is righteous in all that he does. And that I can trust him even though I don't understand it all. So what I want you to understand today is that real faith is exercised in adversity. That's when real faith is exercised, is in adversity. That's when I am required to put my faith on the character of God when something is challenging me. And that's the power of faith. This is when we choose to trust him regardless of what's going on around us. And this is especially true when you encounter the kingdom of darkness. If there is no true faith in your encounter in the kingdom of darkness, you're going to become victim to the kingdom of darkness. You're not going to overcome the kingdom of darkness. So when we encounter darkness, we have to be walking in true faith towards the true God of the Bible. We must be prepared spiritually and physically to confront its influence in people's lives. We must allow Jesus to step on the scene in our lives, lift, lift us out of the bondage, and lead us into the ways of righteousness. That's what salvation is all about. It's about deliverance. Not deliverance from being poor in this world, but being poor spiritually. And knowing how to walk through these trying times in your life. And every one of you have trying times. And that is when real faith is really being tested. That's when faith is being tested. Now you see Jesus is trying to prepare his disciples here. He's trying to say, look, I'm going to be delivered up. I'm going to be Put on, you know, I'm going to be killed. It's going to look like men are going to try to destroy me. We know Jesus gave up his spirit, but man put him on the cross to die there. He says, I'm going to encounter all of this, but on the third day I'm going to raise up. So this brings us to another important lesson on faith. Faith decides to believe. And once a person is decides to believe, then they're brought to an understanding. But most of the time, we're trying to understand something before we choose to approach something from the basis of faith. For instance, if you approach the Bible to understand it, you're going to walk in total unbelief towards it. But if you approach the Bible to believe it, that is true, regardless of whether you understand it. That's faith. And it's at that point of faith that you can be entrusted with understanding or revelation. And it's going to make sense to you. That's the power of faith. Faith allows God to reveal. Faith allows you to receive in the right way. That's the beauty of true faith. So these men were trying to understand. They didn't have the means at the time to understand. First of all, they need an approach by faith to understand. And of course, we know the Spirit of God wasn't there uh, to bring revelation. So they didn't really have the tools to understand. So when I approach something to understand, when I approach something by faith to trust God with what I don't understand, then the Holy Spirit steps on the scene to bring understanding or revelation. Because my faith at that point is reckoned as righteousness by God. 
and I am in the environment of receiving revelation about a matter. And these men did not understand what Jesus was saying. The faith wasn't there, the spirit wasn't there, so understanding eluded them. But when we do understand the matter, people, please hear me, when we do understand the matter, we must be willing to walk through the darkness in confidence. We must be willing to walk through the darkness in confidence. Now, people, it's always easy to claim you have faith when it's never challenged. It's always easy to say, I trust God when your world is not caving in. It's always easy to cl complain, to, to uh, claim great faith when there's no adversity challenging you. But that's the reality of faith. And Peter tells us the reality of faith is that it has to be tried, it has to be tested in order to be refined and be brought to maturity. Because unless I choose to trust something, uh, to trust God in something I don't understand, I'm never going to understand what it means to walk by faith. I'm never going to know what it means to have it counted as righteousness to me so I could be entrusted with revelation. I'm not ever going to understand that. And so what you see is a lot of people never allow their faith to grow and mature. They have this measure of faith given to them at salvation, but they refuse to walk through the adversity. They refuse to approach something on the basis that they're going to trust God, even though it looks like it's going to swallow them up. If they never encounter that, their faith never enlarges, their faith never grows, their faith never brings them to any kind of maturity in Christ. And therefore, they cannot be counted, anything they do cannot be counted as righteousness because nothing is coming from that state or that premise of faith. Simple belief towards God. I'm going to choose to trust him. And you have to keep that in mind. So if we come to a place of darkness, that's when we choose to trust the character of God. We do not try to go into our own personal understanding. That's where people blow it. That's where, because every time you go into your personal understanding, guess what? You're going to come out in total unbelief. Because you did not approach it to by the basis of faith to trust God with this, you approach it to understand so you could walk it out according to your own religious convictions. We walk by faith, not by sight. Sight has to do with understanding. And I choose to trust God, and what is not of faith is sin, and faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Those are all popular scriptures we quote. But how many of them believe it? So I come to the Bible by faith. In other words, I approach it to believe it. And as I believe the word of God, then I have greater revelations of God. And here comes the understanding. Here comes the understanding. Now, many people insist on their own personal understanding. But active faith does not begin until we decide to believe God and his word when there is absolutely no understanding, when nothing makes any sense. That is when real faith is put into action. I choose to believe. Now, the need to personally understand the matter, which is how most of us approach things, will produce the fruits of unbelief and fear in us especially when God fails to perform the way we think he should. And that's the problem. When we approach from our own understanding, we have this idea of what God's going to do for us. And then when he doesn't do it that way, then we go into total unbelief. What faith does is approach God and says, I'm going to believe and trust your character to work something out. And so we have no preconceived notions of how it's going to be. 
We just are going to trust him and cling to him. And so he works that. He brings it about while we're trusting him. And that's the, the beauty of faith. It lets God be God in the situation. It lets him be who he needs to be and do what he needs to do according to his purpose, his plan, his character. And that's why a lot of people get in trouble today, Christians, because they don't understand true faith. Because they're being taught a bunch of garbage out there about faith. And the faith they're being taught serves the person who's teaching it. It has nothing to do with God. And coming to terms with his character. And falling in love with him. Now let's look at 33 and 34. And they came to Caperna, and being in the house, he asked them, What was it that you disputed about among yourselves on the way? <coughs> Excuse me. But they held their peace, for on the way they had disputed among themselves who should be the greatest. One thing you have to understand is that Jesus' disciples were very human and so are we. Very human. And it was not unusual for them to dispute among themselves and argue about things. I mean, you get more than two people together, you're going to have an argument down the line. You're going to have a dispute because we just don't know how to be at peace. And the reason why is there's so much competition and pride in us. And you have to keep that in mind. We don't know how to submit. We don't, have to give, we don't know what it means to give way to anything. We just want our own way. And so you, you get more than two people together. You get two people together, you can have a dispute. And Jesus had 12 men under him. So can you imagine the dispute that often occurred between them? Even though they were trying to be pious, and even though they were following Jesus, so Jesus asked them what the dispute was, what they were discussing. Of course, he already knew what they were discussing. You know, Jesus knew it. But notice they held their peace with him. Why? Because it was embarrassing. Think about it. You're out there disputing about greatness. You know, and then the one who is great says to you, what are you arguing about? How embarrassed would you be? Because I'm going to tell you something that really exposes you. It really exposes you, doesn't it? And if you're going to be embarrassed about something, then you need to know that you're hiding something that you should not be proud of. And what you're hiding is probably pride. Your own pride. Your, whole, your own high opinion of yourself. What you think you deserve, what you think you're worth to God, is what you're hiding. So they held their peace because, no doubt, they were embarrassed to confess what they were arguing about. Now, how many of you have a hard time admitting what you consider important, especially in light of eternity? Because it's all about you, your selfishness, your pride. It's not about God. It's not about what's right. It's not a matter of eternity, other than it might keep you out of eternity. It's because it's embarrassing. It's shameful to discuss those things. It shows where you're at and who you are and who you are allowing yourself to become as you give in to your pride. Now, the argument, of course, was about who will be great in the kingdom of God. So, of course, Jesus is going to address that. So, look at what he, he does in verse 35. He sat down, he called the twelve, and saith unto them, If any man desire to be first, the same shall be last of all, and servant of all. He says, okay, you want to understand greatness? I want to tell you about greatness. Now, one of the things that you have to understand about greatness is it comes down to what your measuring stick is. How do you measure greatness? 
How do you measure it today? Now, let me tell you how most people measure greatness. They measure it according to what they accomplish, what they do. Now, in this case, these men can, can measure it according to what they witnessed. You know, you know, I've seen this, I've seen that. You know, so I'm, I was part of something. Or they, they could have measured it, these men could have measured it uh, by how close they thought they were to Jesus. That's a big measurement. But the reality is that most of the time, if we're really honest about our measuring stick, it's according to this present age we live in. This present age. It's according to the philosophies of the world, in other words. Because the philosophies of the world will determine how people measure something measure its importance, its significance, its greatness. Look at what Paul warns about in Colossians chapter 2 really quickly. I'm going to look at that, Colossians chapter 2. And we're going to look at verse 8. It says, Beware any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world and not after Christ. So what he's saying here is you can have these philosophies that are of the tradition, the religious traditions of men or of the world, and of course that's the basis of where you're coming from, but beware of them because they're not really according to Christ. They're not from him, they don't originate with him, they're not of him. And so most of our measuring sticks of greatness find their base or source in the world not in Christ. And this was true for these men. And as you study this, this situation in the other uh, Gospels, you will see that was true, that their whole philosophy on greatness was based on the world. The influence of the world upon their minds and their thinking. So according to the philosophies of this present age, the one that is great is the one who's being exalted or recognized or draws the biggest crowds or possess the most money or have the most degrees. This is true even in the church. This is especially true in the church. That's how we measure success, greatness. But these are all based in the world's philosophies. They have nothing to do with how God looks at a matter. They're not according to the kingdom of God. So here we have Jesus warning. He says, I'm going to tell you something. If you desire to be first, which is the big idea of greatness, you're going to have to become last. In fact, you're going to have to become a servant of all. Now, that is not what we consider high class. If you're a servant of all, you're not in a high class of people. You're a loser. And so what Jesus is presenting some, to them is something totally contrary to their understanding. Because they were part of the Roman society and the lowest ones on the totem pole were servants. They understood what servitude meant. We do not today. We are servants to money, to idolatry, to sin, to all kinds of things. But we don't understand that we are servants because we think we're free. We're independent people. We are the most enslaved people there, are, there, there is in the world today. We have no clue that we're servants because we think we're we have our life in control. That is so far away from what's really happening. And Jesus is saying, if you understand that when you become the greatest type of servant in the kingdom of God, you will not only know greatness, but you will know liberty. I want you to know, people, I choose to serve Jesus, not sin. And I understand 
the masters that are out there. And I understand I'm a servant, naturally. And I understand all these things. And I don't kid myself. And I don't delude myself about who I'm serving and what I'm serving. And I have found the greatest liberty in serving Christ and not serving men and not serving religion and not serving sin, not serving this world, not serving any of these. These are all entanglements into a web of destruction. And I realized that when I finally became a servant of Christ, I took my life back from all that death and destruction and I gave it to life. And you need to understand that today you're serving someone. You're serving something. You are a slave, but to what? To what are you a slave to? (coughs) Excuse me. So if you desire to be first in the kingdom of God, you're going to be last. And if you're willing to become a servant of all, truly a servant of all, you will become first. But you will not see yourself in that limelight. You will not feel yourself being important in anything. And you need to understand that. You will be humbled by it. You will walk in submission to it. You will have the same attitude Christ took on. So he could die on the cross for you and me. You better understand that today. I'll tell you something, the the things I see in Christianity today is totally contrary to what the Bible teaches. We need to get back to the center of truth. We need to develop that attitude that Christ is talking about. And he says, you're going to have to be a servant. And they understood that because they had servants all around them. You have to have the right attitude. Now, it's vital that understanding about greatness lines up to the kingdom of God and not according to this present world. I, I'm, I admit that when I started out in full-time ministry, I had the, uh, the same standards of the world as far as greatness and what I, what I witnessed in the church. And it's not true. I'm talking about the visible church. That's not true. That is not the right standard. That is not the right perception. We need to agree with what God says. We need to understand that. The greatness, the key to greatness, God's kingdom is servitude. You must have a, a, the attitude of a true servant towards God. So the reason that he brought this out is because we will pursue after that which we will perceive will make us great. That will allow us to come into this place where we're on top of the game, so to speak. And he's saying, it's wrong, it's wrong, it's wrong. That's why you're disputing. It's wrong. You have a wrong attitude about all of this. You need to line up to what God, God's perception about true greatness in his kingdom. Now to bring home this point, consider the example Jesus gave his disciples in verse 36. And he took a child and set him in the midst of them, and when he had taken him in his arms, he said unto them, Whosoever shall receive one of such children in my name receiveth me, and whosoever shall receive me Receive not me, but him that sent me. He put a child in his midst and says, look, this is an example of someone who can truly receive by faith. Now, he's pointing to the disposition of a child is what he's doing at this point. And this is very important. We have to have an attitude of a servant, but in order to have the right attitude of a servant of God, we have to have a disposition of a child. And you see, to be a a good servant, a lot of it depends on how you receive instructions. A child will receive with an open mind. They will be content and satisfied to accept 
what their parents are telling them. So they have this disposition that allows them to receive instructions or, or um, encouragement or whatever you want to call it, to receive from God in the way that they need to receive in order to be truly a great servant. So right now you're going to say, well, Ray, I'm serving God. But do you have a disposition of the child where you truly can receive the things of God in a proper way so you can turn around and serve him in a way that's right and honorable? That's the question here. Because if you don't have the right disposition, you cannot be a great servant in the kingdom of God. You can't be a great servant. And you have to keep that in mind. Now, we see Jesus is definitely addressing their pride by using the example of the child. We clearly need this disposition of a child if we're going to have the attitude of a servant to be, to be used in the kingdom of God. So do you have that today? We have to have that openness, that trust, that sincerity towards God. Now, we see Jesus uh, is trying to bring the reality of their pride to the forefront, saying, look at what is really motivating you. And look how far away from the mark it is. You know, Jesus always brings contrast. And he did that in parables, and he's doing that with this illustration of the child. Now we're going to see how this pride also works uh, in another arena. Look at verse 38. John answered him, saying, Master, we saw one casting out devils in thy name, and he followed not us, and we forbade him because he followed not us. So here you have a situation where... John is saying, you know, we saw this guy who's not part of our elite group going out and casting out devils in your name. And we told him to quit because he's not part of our group. Now, does this sound familiar? Oh, does it ever. This is called what we call self-righteousness, religious pride, whatever. And what we have a tendency to do is put our pride in our denomination, in our leader, in our associations, or whatever, and, and, and we put our pride in there because, you know, we're the elite group. We're the one that has the corner on the truth. And if you're not part of our group, you, you, you basically are in the in-group, and, and, and you're considered worthless, you're considered stupid because, you know, after all, I'm smart enough to see it. Why can't you? And that's our attitude is pride. And we see this religious pride in every group. It doesn't matter. Well, you know, my leader is so-and-so. You know, my denomination is so-and-so. Well, you know, I get taught this, so-and-so. So you see how elite we are. You see how special we are. Well, you know, uh, my pastor is a, is a man, and your pastor is a woman. So that tells you a lot about you and your group. You talk about elite snobbery and elite arrogance and elite pride. And it's easy to get caught up in that because so much of what we do comes from this essence of who we think we are and how smart we think we are and how much we think we know. And these men were by Jesus. These men were part of the in crowd because they were with Jesus. So look at what Jesus says here. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> trying to get over cold. Verse 39, <coughs> excuse me, but Jesus said, Forbid him not, for there is no man who shall do a miracle in my name that can lightly speak evil of me, for he that is not against us, 
is for us. Wow. He says, why don't tell them to quit? Because if he's really speaking and in my name, then he is accomplishing things for my sake, for this kingdom. So don't forbid him, because he can't be against us. He has to be for us. Therefore, don't stop him. People, I don't care how the gospel gets out there. Uh, Paul says that people preach the gospel, even the cost him difficulties, but let them so do it. Because God can do whatever he wants to do through that. It doesn't matter if a person is preaching the gospel in the right way or in the, in the right spirit, because God still can use that. He's not limited. And so people, you've got to be very careful. We all do that we adopt this, this arrogant attitude because of our relig religious association. No one denomination or fellowship has a corner on the things of God. Now, Brian, you may be learning great things that far exceed some of the other things that are being taught out there. Okay? But it still doesn't make you special. You have to realize he can use anything or anyone to do his bidding. For instance, he used a donkey with Balaam. And guess what? He's even used me. I remember one time I was uh, trying to reason with God. Because I had, had, a, had a high opinion of myself. I watched him use some pretty, what I call, you know, questionable people. And I'm saying, God, here am I. And, you know, and I was quit presenting my most noble presentation to him. And he listened to my presentation. And I never will forget the words that came into my spirit from him. And it shocked me. He said, I don't need you. I don't need you. And it just all of a sudden pulled me up short. And I thought, he doesn't need me. He could use the rocks to cry forth his message. He could use the donkey. He could use anyone. Because he's, using very, he's used various unlikely people in my life. And I sat there just stunned. You know, our attitude is God needs us, so he'll put up with anything from us. I want you to know he doesn't need you, and he will not put up with anything from you. And then he spoke to me again. I desire to use you, but it's on my terms. People, it's got to be his terms. And his terms is you must be a servant. You must have the attitude of a servant. You must have a disposition of a child. If he's going to use you to the full potential, he can. Or otherwise, you're useless to him. He may use what you say, but he's still not using you. He may use what you do, but he's still not using you. And if you're going to have any identification with him, it's a matter of being used. He uses you, not what you say or do, you. You become his vessel, his instrument, and in which his power flows through. You need to understand that. Everything we learn or experience in this kingdom is for one purpose, and please don't forget, is to glorify him in true service, to be an extension of him to others which will express itself in practical service. Look at that verse 41. For whosoever shall give you a cup of water, drink in my name, because you belong to Christ, verily I say unto you, ye shall not lose his reward. He says, if you truly, as a servant, in the disposition of a child, give even a cup of cold water in my name, your reward will be assured. People, most of Christianity is practical service. Look around you and see how you can help and serve others. We are so selfish, we don't care. We don't care what other people are going through. We don't care to find out what they're going through because we might have to be 
uh, we might have to get on our knees and do what's right and honorable. We don't want to. So I can live in ignorance towards everybody's problems. I can judge them from one end to the next. But I can live in ignorance and, and know that I don't know what I'm talking about, but I can act like I'm an authority because of my pride and my arrogance. And you know nothing. You get in the trenches with people and you'll start learning some things. And you'll learn that the love of God cannot turn a deaf ear to the needs of others. And will not insist on being ignorant so that he doesn't have a responsibility. If he did, he wouldn't have sent his son. He would have never entered into our plight, become identified with us so we could become identified in the righteousness of God. You have to understand that today. How God needs to have mercy on us. Because we really don't understand anything. Because we've listened to things according to the philosophies of the world and not according to the heart of God. Question is, what about you? What attitude do you possess towards the matters of heaven? Are you a child in disposition, or do you harbor pride about the matters of his kingdom? Pride of self-importance. Pride of self-righteousness. Pride of not thinking I'm too above them to, to lower myself to where they're at. If you do, you need to know that you are not really being identified as a servant. And you will never be great. And when it comes down to God using you, he will put you last rather than first. Have mercy upon us. Lord God, I just thank you that your truths are so simple that a child can understand them and receive them. Receive them, but forgive us for complicating things in our selfishness and our self righteousness, our arrogance and our pride. Forgive us, Lord, because we have done such a disservice to you. We have failed to bring you glory and reflect your heart in this world. Forgive us and convict us by the power of your spirit today and strip away the religious cloaks and show us. Show us, Lord, by your power what you really want us to understand about our life today in you. And we say this in your name. Amen.